Welcome, everybody. Tonight is our Poet Artist Development Program's Professional Development Seminar on the idea or the concept of the artist as a business owner. This, of course, is part of our, uh, you know, larger Poet Artist Development Program. The handout that you see here in front of you is available to you to download now off of our Google Classroom for those of you fully enrolled in the Poet Artist Development Program. For anybody that is, in fact, watching this afterwards in the uh, YouTube world or uh, even now actively on the live stream, you know, the purpose of these particular workshops or seminars is really to uh, live up to our mission statement, which is, you know, listed right here. So Distill Arts is a nonprofit arts mentorship organization that inspires, teaches, and hires emerging artists from underserved communities. Our acronym, the DSTL, does stand for something. It is Develop Skills and Transcend Limits Through the Arts. And the main purpose for me starting this organization 10 years ago now was really because I needed to find my own place in, in the community as an artist. Uh, but also, you know, I found it very difficult to gain the skills of a working artist. You know, working artists are people who are constantly using their art to create a, you know, safer space for their community while also developing their own artistic practice. And the way I look at it is, you know, we all are potential change makers. So everything that we do through Distill Arts really is focused on not only developing the art as a skill, but the skills of an entrepreneur uh, so that any artist that is looking to turn this into a career can overcome any challenges that they might have uh, through art as their primary practice. The programs that we offer for anyone who is not familiar with Distill Arts include not only the Poet Artist Development Program, the one that is in fact offering this particular seminar, uh, but it also includes our Creative Impact Workshops, uh, which is a sub-program from within the Poet Artist Development Program. We also have our Conchas y Café Bilingual Community Writing Workshops, which are 15-week series of uh, workshops for adults that primarily focus on teaching creative writing skills, and they culminate in the publication of a biannual Conchas y Café zine. We also have Art Block Zine, which is our monthly podcast and annual publication that features artists from LA County, and Artistic Zine, which is specifically focused on showcasing the diversity of talents within the neurodivergent community. So if you know anyone who is autistic and is also practicing art, uh, living across the US, in fact, they are welcome to submit to Artistic Zine. And if at any point during today's session, you know, those of you who are joining in live as, as mentees in the program, you know, y'all are always welcome to, you know, jump in with any questions, just feel free to, you know, raise your hand or unmute, uh, whatever works for you to uh, have your voice heard. Um, but as is customary in most of our programs, we like to start off with a small quote. And today's quote comes from the uh, the very famous Paulo Coelho. And Paulo Coelho, if in case you aren't familiar with him, was born on August 24th in the year 1947 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, Coelho attended Jesuit schools and was raised by devout Catholic parents. He determined early on that he wanted to be a writer, but was discouraged by his parents who saw no future in that profession in Brazil. Coelho's Rebellious adolescence spurred his parents to commit him to a mental asylum three times, starting when he was 17 years old. And for those who might, you know, know who he is, uh, you know, that didn't stop him. You know, he has approximately 33 books and is definitely the most famous Brazilian author abroad, at least in contemporary times. Um, and his books have been translated into 88 languages, and he has been published in 170 countries. Over 320 million copies of his books have been sold worldwide. So with all of that context, you know, what do y'all think about this quote that comes from him? Every blessing ignored becomes a curse. What does this say to you? 
especially if you think about his his life story. Feel free to raise your hands or unmute. And now Abraham says he's killing it. Yes, Evan? I think in relation to his story, it's, you know, his parents not really seeing the the brightness in him and the creativity and what it could be, you know, honed in on. But I think also it's that feeling of when you want to try something and then you get too afraid to do it. And then it's always in the back of your head, like I should have done it. Mm. Yeah, kind of like the uh, the regret of not doing something can become your your penance, right? That sort of idea. Exactly. Least, yeah, I I could definitely you know agree with that. You know, I a little little backstory to to how distill arts came to be. Um, approximately ten years ago, I actually was hospitalized. And I was hospitalized with some severe stomach pain. And I thought that I had developed cancer because according to the doctors, that was one of the possibilities. Um, so, you know, at that point in my life, I was like, well, you know what? I've wanted to create my own nonprofit for a long time as an artist. And, you know, that was one of the reasons why Distill Arts came to be at that particular time period in my life. So. Yeah, I, I can definitely agree with that. You know, I didn't want to live with the regret of not having done what I felt I was meant to do. But Nancy, what That's do you have? Cool. That's I love that. I feel, I mean, I feel similarly about having sort of my work to do in the world. I think a lot of us do, especially artists and creatives. Um, and I feel for me, you know, it's like sacred work. <laughs> um, and in my evolved state, I mean, not that I'm that evolved, but in my more evolved state, I feel like I can enjoy the blessings. But in my previous states, sometimes when I ignored my desire and my compulsion to create, because I do feel like I have a compulsion to create, um, if I ignored that or was like, I should be someone else, you know, um, or I should go get you know, this X, Y, and Z job, fit in society, all of that, um, it becomes a curse because then I start acting out and I get angry and I'm upset and I'm frustrated and then I do all sorts of bad choices. Um, so for me, creating is definitely like how I bring out the blessings and avoid the curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. An artist needs to create, right? A poet needs to poet. And it's for sure for a majority of artists that I've met in my lifetime, a, a compulsion, you know, this is something that goes beyond just a hobby for us. This is something that, that really becomes kind of core to our identity. And if we deny ourselves that it could definitely become something toxic. So I'm, I'm with you on that one, Nancy. Uh, Roots and then Abraham. Yes, I definitely agree with you guys. I feel like Personally, of course, um, we each speak even from our our perspective, and I feel that it saved like doing art, whether it be writing or dancing or painting. Like I feel like that saved me, and it would it like filled a void that I was trying to fill with other things, mm -hmm. and it all comes back to like the core belief that we're all created in the image of the most high and he's a creator so therefore we're creators and if we're not creating then we're not fulfilling our purpose and we we feel like there's something missing so that's what I've learned and why I've learned to honor like you know being a creative even though know, I have four children and a bunch of things going on like I know that this is not just a hobby. It's a lifeline. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We, I think we can all really feel that, you know. Um, Abraham? Yeah, I don't know if you guys have seen people listening to music and the urge of going to the dance floors, you know. It's that that dancer who wants to dance right and talking to many artists is, is always they're doing something sometimes but they have that itch to go into the world and 
create art and explore that art or, or communicate. So I think for us to notice that we have a blessing, which is our talent or our innate inhabit to, to, to the explore the, the, the communication, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that you don't want to stop doing because it's just not the world who's going to miss that, but you yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. that's helpful. And if you keep that art going, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I like that you brought that up, Abraham, because it's not just the world that misses out, you know, it's, it's you that miss out, right? If you don't practice the art that you were meant to practice, or if that, if it's, you know, something that, that you just don't look to develop, you know, there will be things that you will miss out on opportunities that you will miss out on. And, you know, we can sometimes even, um, begin suffering mental mentally or physically you know there's there's definitely correlations to being unhappy and not doing the things that that actually fulfill you in a in a broader sense you know so uh there's there's definitely a lot of that i think that that this quote is trying to express you know um we we do want to embrace the things that that we have within us that that make us who we are so with that said, um, yeah, I'm glad that these interpretations are making sense. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's important that we embrace who we are, right? And when we think about who we are and, we, you know, we try to think about the ways in which we go about earning a living, you know, those are things that don't always have to go uh, in, in one direction or another. They are sometimes things that we can actually merge together to turn into a very fulfilling life and career. And one of the ways in which we can do that is by asking ourselves these three questions, which I have to give Nancy credit for bringing these up um, when we were planning this lesson. You know, these were definitely the kinds of questions that I had been thinking um, and had been reflecting on when I started Distill Arts. You know, it's uh, yeah, an artist, artists at work. Thank you, Nancy, for giving credit where credit is due there, too. Um, but these are definitely the kinds of questions that I was asking myself as I developed the business plan for Distill Arts. You know, what are the things that I am good at personally? You know, what are the things that interest me? What are the things that I like to do, you know, to express my creativity? And also, what is it that the world needs? right? What is the one thing that I see that is missing for artists like myself? And so those three questions that you see on your screen right now, you know, those were the questions that helped me formulate ultimately what is now Distill Arts. And keep in mind, thinking of yourself as an artist and as a business owner, you know, can be daunting at first, but with some basic planning, you can kind of start to overcome any doubts and fears that you might have, you know, that are related to turning this into a career. That's really the main reason why we're, we're going through it in this fashion, by offering these monthly seminars, um, but also through the mentorship, you know, that, that you're receiving through, through our weekly meetings. These are questions that you can always ask and you can always expect us to, to help you answer for yourself. You know, this is where kind of the, the, the polishing of your career can, can take place. So at any point, you know, during today's session or after today's session, those of you in the Poet Artist Development Program, you know, this is, this is for you. This is so that you can answer these questions for yourself and continue on with a life that, that you choose as opposed to one that is forced upon you. <laughs> Number one, kick butt. Two, less butts to be kicked. Three, high kick. Yeah, and go. this, oh, I don't know if you can see, but this is a visual representation. Oh my gosh, I need to get it at the right angle. There it is. <laughs> um, it's a Venn diagram of these three things. So in the middle is the sweet spot and that's where we want to be. Right, right. So, you know, we're going to come back to these three questions throughout today's session, but here they are in order. What are you good at? What does the world need? 
And what do you love to do? So, you know, when you think of the questions, you know, you might want to start kind of going down the path of like, well, these are the skills that I bring and these are the things that that I can do. Um, but it's also very, very important to understand, too, that your work yourself as an artist, you know, it has a value to it, right? Your your artistic skills, they can have a monetary value assigned to them. And when you assign a value to your work, it's going to be based on things like time and experience. And what I mean by time and experience, it's not just the time that you take in producing the work. It's also the time that you take practicing, becoming better, going to workshops, and also the time that it takes for you to learn a new skill too. If you're paying for a class here and there through, say, UCLA Extension, or you know, if you're taking a, I don't know, adult school class on graphic design, you know, that investment that you are making in yourself should be and will be ultimately reflected in the price that you charge for your services in the future. That's how you assign value to your work. It's a, it's a whole like conglomeration of all the things that have gone into you achieving the, the skill level that you have, you know, which is obviously the second way in which you would assign a value to your work. You know, granted, there's like, you know, maybe more amateurish artists who are out there, you know, charging more money. Um, but, you know, art is subjective. And a person's skill is also relatively subjective. But there are certain things that you can measure, like how quickly you can produce something or to what degree you are able to, um, I don't know, manipulate a particular tool, you know, and those kinds of things are the things that do add a value to your skill, your level of, of work. Um, and it's always good to be self-reflective on that, right? What is What is it that you're capable of that no one else is? And then, of course, equipment and supplies. You know, we have to be able to pay for things like our computers, our, you know, cameras. We have to be able to pay for, like, you know, paintbrushes and canvas and all of those things that are necessary for us to complete our tasks. So those are, generally speaking, the three things that will inform the value of your work, right? It's also really important to understand that promoting yourself is going to be a part of this. You know, being a business owner, whether it is as an artist, a working artist, or a coffee shop owner, I mean, promotion is going to be a big part of it. So not only assessing the things that you're able to bring to the table, but also how you're going to market that. How are you going to communicate that story to your audience? At the bare minimum, it's important to have a website. But, you know, there's also obviously social media and there's different types of social media and there are different uses for different platforms. So in the end, you'll want to find the one that works for you, that speaks to your audience the most. And that obviously doesn't uh, keep you from working uh, in the in the ways that you want to work. And then, of course, the physical media, too, you know, business cards, postcards, posters, you know, those physical things that have been used for decades and decades, they're still being used today for a reason because they do actually work. So it's always good to carry business cards with you. It's always good to consider using uh, printed flyers for certain kinds of things. You know, marketing materials do change and evolve over time, but there's ways in which you can use them even as a work of art in themselves. And it's also very important that you consider the fact that you are creating a brand, you know, whether it's your name that you're using as a brand, you know, if it's especially your name, you really want to treat it with respect. You know, don't uh, go around posting, you know, photos on social media of things that would potentially come back and, and, you know, reflect poorly or negatively on you or a partner that you might be working with in the future. Um, it's also really important that as a brand, you are completing work, you know, that you not just start a project, but you also see it all the way through to the end, because that's going to demonstrate to people your ability to actually accomplish a task, um, be reliable, be consistent, and then continually produce at your best. You know, there's always going to be growth in, in the world, you know, and 
each one of us is going to continue to grow as an artist as we as we continue to practice. So uh, every moment, always try to produce at your best. And definitely do not treat this as a hobby or a side hustle. You know, if you want this to be your career, if you really truly believe in your your um, gift as a working artist, then really treat it as such and try to take all the things that you can and implement them in your everyday practice, whether it be, you know, taking the time to craft a couple of clever social media posts, you know, that you can schedule out for the rest of the week, you know, do that once a week and then spend the rest of the week dedicated to your craft, you know, creating something new, you know, doing the uh, financial uh, things that, that you sometimes have to do, you know, like really genuinely treat it like it's a job, treat it like the career that you want it to be. Um, what are we seeing in the chat? Create a piece, but to present it, a pies with no money, take the money and run. Oh yeah, the one about the museum, right? Yeah. And then... The structural elements of creation is so helpful. Cool. Yeah, well, you know, we're definitely going to try and give you more tools uh, to, to help you as we go. So, um, but these are these are good starting points, right? To start thinking in the mindset of an entrepreneur, because that's a lot of times where we get stuck, right? A lot of us get stuck in the mindset of, oh, I'm an artist and I shouldn't get paid X amount. No, that's actually incorrect. Because you are an artist, you should be getting paid the amount that is equivalent to your skill level, to the time commitment that you put into it, and to the, you know the cost of supplies and equipments. That is your right. You deserve to be paid at least $100 an hour, at least, for any work that you do as an artist. And that's something that you really need to begin to accept, which you know might sound kind of hard to do. But it is a fact, you know, as artists, we bring a value to our culture that no other person can. So definitely, you know, put yourself in that mind frame and allow yourself to sit there in comfort, you know, because it could be un uncomfortable at first. But again, you have to really ask yourself this question, what are you good at? You know, and if you really, truly believe that you are good at art, then you will deserve that hundred dollars an hour pay rate as an artist. So be comfortable with that. Um, can I jump in just real quick? Um, you made me made me think that yes, uh, as an example, and tying this back to the teaching artist thing earlier, and why the that's such a great opportunity is because California Poets in the Schools is an example of an organization that helps artists uh, be teaching artists and make a living and they suggest charging between 100 and 150 dollars per hour you know so yeah just throwing out that little example mm -hmm. and you know the 100 dollars an hour to be completely honest with you is not probably going to be the actual rate that you're working at because within that 100 dollars an hour you're also probably talking about like another hour of planning right and preparation so Realistically, it's probably closer to $50 an hour, but in the case of like, you know, poets in the schools, you're, you're charging that amount to, to the school or to the organization that is bringing you in, because that is the value of your service. As a poet, as a professional artist, those are the things that people are looking for, right? And they are more than happy to pay that when they can afford it. And if they can't afford it, there's also other opportunities like through the Poets and Writers um, mini grants, you know, and there's other things that you can offer as like an added resource for organizations and for schools who maybe are underfunded and can't afford you. So there's always a way to get paid, but stick to your guns, you know, really stick to your rate. And if you genuinely feel like you are prepared to charge $100 an hour, be comfortable with that. And I think that that is a good baseline for everyone to to generally start at. Um, know yourself and know your worth, as Angie says. Yeah, then definitely do not work for free whenever possible. You know, be strategic about it if you are going to work for free, but 
really, when it comes down to it, try not to work for free as, as much as you can. So um, a couple notes on actually being a business owner. Um, you know, business incorporation is beneficial, but not always necessary for a working artist. You could potentially operate as a business owner, as a sole proprietor. And it's really important that I also say before I move on that I am not a tax expert. I am in no way a lawyer or, you know, any kind of uh, like qualified, quote unquote, individual to tell you the ins and outs of these different uh, structures, organizational structures. But as someone that did go through the entire process of starting a nonprofit organization, I can definitely tell you that uh, there are organizations out there, such as the Public Council, which is located here in LA. Um, they're a nonprofit legal services organization that does help you understand much better than what I could ever do. The difference between being a sole proprietor, a limited liability corporation, and also the things that you would need in order to become a nonprofit organization. So definitely look into those services if that's something you want to do. But that said, I can tell you for sure that to be a sole proprietor in the state of California, at least, it does not require fully incorporating. And it's also the kind of thing where your personal assets are very closely tied to the business. So if you prefer to have the separation between your personal assets, your personal cash, your personal vehicle, all of that, you may want to consider going the route of incorporating as an LLC, a limited liability corporation. Um, because you know there there are benefits to having a separation between work and your personal life. Um, however, you know there's other benefits to to just simply operating as a sole proprietor, uh, such as not having to go through the entire process of incorporating, um, other than just filing a doing business as form with the city of LA, the county, and the state. Um, also, you know when it comes to funding. You know, to start a business, you if you feel like you need to go the credit line, um, the credit route, you know, your credit worthiness is dependent on you as an individual uh, when it comes to a sole proprietorship. Whereas if you go the limited liability corporation, you know, that means you can do it on your own. Um, you could potentially uh, still get certain types of credit cards and, you know, certain lines of credit as an individual, but having an incorporated business that is functioning as an LLC means you could also bring on other people. And this is especially good if part of your journey involves working as part of a co-op or creating a co-op of artists um, where each member of your organization has defined roles and responsibilities. Uh, you know, so with more people involved, your funding opportunities might be better because of, you know, more people's credit is going to be used in order to get, you know, a line of credit. There's also certain types of grants and fellowships that, you know, might work for you to, to have a co-op, um, you know, but oftentimes you'll find that it requires one single person to be the applicant for those kinds of applications. Um, and then you can, you know, redistribute the money accordingly. So, so a couple of things to think about if you decide to go the incorporation route. Um, and then if you do decide to work as part of a group, I actually, uh, many years ago, created co-op agreements that um, I'm sharing with you here. And this is something that you can always take a look at and review for your own purposes if you decide that you want to actually create a sort of member membership based co-op that that you would function that, that would allow you to function as a business. So uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but generally speaking, put things in writing. You know, if you're going to work with other people, always put them in writing and always ask everyone to actually sign these things sign and date because uh it's a great way to protect yourselves all legally 
Um, that way no one is left kind of holding the bags in the very end. Yes, contracts. Um, <laughs> and well, you know, in the case of like taxes, Abraham is saying, no helping me with my taxes. Yeah, I can't help you with your taxes, but you know, if you do uh, decide to incorporate as a sole proprietorship or LLC, there are actually um, organizations out there that that will help you with the taxes. Um, depending on how much you earn, they can help you for free even. So, you know, there's there are certain benefits to that. Um, but again, contracts, for sure, put everything down in some form of a contract or some sort of membership agreement if you decide to work with other people in the establishing of your own creative business. Now, there's also the business structure that I get asked about a lot, being that I did start a nonprofit, you know, but if you are a person with a charitable bent, right, meaning you want to do not just your own art, but you want to involve your community, there are ways to do so. And there are, you know, certain benefits to incorporating as a nonprofit over not. But, you know, one of the ways in which you can do that is by certifying your business as a B corporation. Now, a B corporation is not an actual uh, like corporate structure that you would file with the IRS or anything like that. Um, it's just simply a certification. And it's a certification that is led and established by the B Lab, which is a nonprofit organization itself. Um, the B Corporation certification is for for profit businesses only. Um, it does require legal incorporation in some manner. So if you're going to do it as a sole proprietor, you could do it. If you're going to do it as an LLC, you can. Um, but the thing about this is that it is going to require a lot of documentation. So, you know, the question to certify or not is really going to depend on how much you want to demonstrate to the public that you are doing social justice or environmental justice focused um, programming or services. Um, and it could potentially open you up to other contracting opportunities in the future, whether that be with like the city of LA or the county, who do sometimes show preference to certain types of certified organizations. Um, but, you know, the certification process might be kind of expensive. And as a micro business, a business with maybe one or two employees, uh, you might not necessarily benefit from it right away. It's always something that you can set up as a goal for yourself, but, you know, not, not always necessary. And the same goes with being a nonprofit. You know, a nonprofit is still a business. You know, I can still, as the leader of Distal Arts, make sure that Distal Arts turns a profit and that we have you know, earnings that are coming in to cover all of our expenses and then some. But the difference between a nonprofit organization and a for-profit organization is just simply that all profits that are made will be reinvested into the community through our programming. So it's not like I get to walk away at the end of the year with, you know, a fat bonus check. Um, if I somehow make Distal Arts actually earn money, that's not at all how it works. I am able to pay myself. I am able to, you know, have a staff that is getting paid, you know, and if in the future I'm able to actually hire people full time and pay them benefits, like just like any other business, those would be the things that uh, that we would be able to do. Um, no Ferraris. Sorry, Abraham. <laughs> but you know, a nonprofit really does serve the community through either charitable acts. Um, there's different types, which include things like religious nonprofits, science-based nonprofits, ones that are about public safety testing, um, literary nonprofits like Distal Arts. There's, of course, the educational and other, which includes things like, you know, arts-based nonprofits, music-based, you know, humanities, that kind of thing. Um, there are different classifications with different restrictions and different uh, sort of documentation things for churches and other religions. Um, private foundations, certain types of political organizations can also still be registered as a nonprofit, even though most 501c3 classifications reduce or highly limit political activity. Um, but they do exist, and there's you know certain rules with that that they can kind of work within. 
Yes, Richard. Uh, I, I had a odd question about nonprofits. I heard once that uh, nonprofits uh, are actually allowed to spend up to 90% of donations on admin activities, such as if it's a sole artist uh, uh, nonprofit. Is that at all accurate? Um, yes, and it depends. Um, you know, the way in which an, a nonprofit operates is going to largely depend on the type of nonprofit that it is. So like if it's a political, if it were a political action based nonprofit, as an example, one that maybe does rent advocacy for low income communities, well, you're more than likely going to have a pretty high administrative overhead you know, of people who are working, operating programs, that kind of thing. So like 90% of their budget might go to things like staff, you know, and then a remaining 10% might go to things like office supplies, printing, you know, pamphlets and doing that kind of thing. So it sort of depends on how the funds are being used. But the main idea is still the same in that a nonprofit can operate bring in revenue through a variety of services that they provide and then any like profits that are made off of their activities any money that is left over it has to be reinvested into their mission into the fulfillment of their mission is basically the the best way to think about it so so it can work um in that sort of 90 10 kind of split um and, you know, you can always find out how much money a nonprofit is using on their community uh, or for their community-based programming by looking at their 990. Uh, every single year, every 501c3 nonprofit is required to file a 990. Depending on the budget size of the nonprofit, they might have to do one that is more detailed versus uh, sh like a short form. Um, micro nonprofits, ones that make less than, if I remember correctly, $25,000 a year, they only do like a little postcard size thing that basically just says, you know, we don't make enough money to, to fully show you all of the ways in which we spend our money um, because our programs are primarily volunteer based or whatever the case might be. But yeah, there's, there's different ways in which you can always look at a nonprofit's financials and determine whether or not they're either overpaying their sal their staff salaries or you know they're they have a good mix a good balance of administrative overhead versus you know programming so it's a good question thank you for asking that richard um of course you know this nonprofit status is something that is challenging to get at first and it's also going to require a lot of work to maintain so to be honest with you as the person that founded distill arts 10 years ago you know i would say it was worth it for distill arts but it might not be worth it for every person um if you are operating as an artist as an individual or even if you're working as a co-op with a couple of other people you could always go the route of being fiscally sponsored in order to accept donations. And that would be done in partnership with another nonprofit, but it's not always going to be the best option for you right up front. That's something that you might wanna take time to think about before you, you move on. Um, the one benefit of course is, you know, there's a diversity of funding sources from private donations to fee for services. Uh, grants, fellowships, all of those good things that artists always take advantage of as well. So, you know, with that, it brings us to the second question, right? What does the world need? Do they need another nonprofit or do they need you, an artist, an individual who is working with the community or an individual who is working to, to celebrate and represent their community? You know, which one is going to be the most beneficial to the world at this moment in time? You know, these things can always change in the future, but it's good to ask yourself that question, especially if you're considering going down that particular route. What does the world really need? And yeah, as Angie says, the world needs the best version of you. Being able to tell that story is really important, though, 
right? And that's where branding starts to come in. So if you start thinking about yourself as an artist, as not just an individual, but also a brand, those are the things that are going to start to help you articulate better your story. So branding is more than just a catchy logo. It's more than just a business name. It's also your mission, right? This is your your statement of purpose, ultimately, and your vision for your company, for your organization. One way in which you could potentially start crafting a mission statement is by just simply filling in the blanks that you see here, right? And this is a good, simple little, uh, like, brainstorming activity that you could do even now. Um, but it's basically going to be my company, blank, exists to blank, right? And this is something, a mission statement is something that you have as both an internal document and an external document, meaning this is something that the public will probably find somewhere on your website. This is your, essentially your reason for doing what you are doing. A vision statement is very similar to a mission statement, but a vision statement is going to be a little bit more about where you want the company to be, right? Where do you as an artist want to be five years from now, 10 years from now? You know, this could maybe tie into your mission statement, um, but this could also be maybe like a project vision, right? This could be where one individual project that you are working on will will go over the course of the next several years, right? So that's kind of the difference between a mission statement and a vision statement. Vision statements are typically internal only. That's for, for you and whoever is working with you to reflect on and to work towards. It's also very important to be good about articulating your values. What are the values that you are using in every approach that you take when creating your business practice? You know, is it things like buzzwords like innovation or diversity? Is it community? Is it the concept of, you know, artistic freedom? You know, what are the things that you value as an individual? What are the things that really make you just excited to do the work that you're doing? Some of these uh, little phrases or words that you use to, to develop your core values, they might be things that you would put on marketing material. You know, it could also be portions of your mission statement. Those are always really good words or phrases for you to have somewhere to reflect on, to help just keep you motivated as to, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. And then, of course, your audience. You know, your audience is going to be probably one of the most important reasons why your business will thrive, because if you are putting their needs and interests front and center along with yours, you know, your your approach to everything will dramatically change. And it will be one of the things that actually allows you to not only create something that fulfills you, but also allows you to bring other people in to support you. Because in the end, I mean, we all need to get paid. And there's a reason, again, why you should be aiming for that $100 an hour. And it's because, you know, you'll have an audience that will be more than happy to, to pay that, to, to value your services in the same way that you value your services. And of course, when we're talking about audience, it very much is important to have demographic information to understand, you know, where the concept of accessibility has its limitations. You know, certain income brackets may not be able to afford $100 an hour. And if you understand that, then you can, again, like I said before, come with resources to help that community achieve the $100 an hour, you know, that, that you're asking. So, you know, understanding your audience in multiple ways is going to be very, very valuable for you at, at any point in your career. Um, and it'll also be really good for you to understand what their needs are. You know, the, the needs of one community are different based on a whole host of things from, you know, geographic location to technological resources to, um, you know, even something as simple as like, uh, I don't know, gluten allergies, <laughs> you know, if you're a baker and you're baking with gluten, like it's a small thing, but it's a big thing for some people, you know. So again, audience, very important. Which again, brings us to 
what do you love to do? You know, when you think about it and you really reflect on your purpose as an artist, you know, this is going to be a question that you'll probably find yourself asking yourself often. You know, do I really love to be an administrator? In my case, no, I don't. You know, I actually very much prefer being the artist. But at the same time, I understand that, you know, to do that, I have to do the, the administrative stuff. And, you know, there's a certain charm to it sometimes. There's a certain sort of sense of accomplishment that I get from it. And, you know, I can't say that I'll always love it, but, you know, it, it has grown on me. And it's something that I feel I'm, I'm capable of doing at this point. Thank you, Angie, for thinking I do a good job. So, again, how do we articulate these things? How do we articulate the things that we love to do, the things that we're good at doing, or the things that we want to do for the world? A mission statement can look something like this. And I use the Distill Arts one as an example, um, partly because it does a few different things, right? It tells us not only what the organization's name is, right, Distill Arts, but it also tells us what it is. We are a nonprofit arts mentorship organization. So that's the what. Now, the why is going to be this part right here. You know, we're an organization that inspires, teaches, and hires emerging artists, right? And the who is, of course, emerging artists from underserved communities. So ultimately, what our mission statement is answering is the what, the why, and the who. Those three things are the things that really are the most important ones when crafting a mission statement. You know, it's our goal. It is our mission. It is our purpose to inspire, teach, and hire emerging artists just like you. And that's what we're doing every day through our program. And, you know, if people have questions about it, then that's your opportunity to say, well, you know, guess what we do? You know, we do mentorships. We do different zines. We have different publications. We have workshops. All of those things are all in the service of our mission. And that's one way in which you could potentially articulate your story, right? As an artist, you can say, you know, I, Angie, am a poet that works with community uplifts community and preserves community you know do three different things and boom you have a mission statement right there so yeah that's right um so here we're going to take a quick moment for all of you to do a quick little activity and i'd like you all and you can do this in the chat or you can do this on a separate sheet of paper but make a quick list of words that describe your artwork and your vision for it. Or AKA, try to answer the question, what are you good at and what do you love to do? I'll leave this up on the screen here for a quick second. Um, I'll give you all, let's say two minutes. And let's see what you can come up with in two minutes. All right. Continue working on this, right? This is going to be something that you will definitely benefit from in the future. And you'll see why when we get towards the very end. Now, just to continue on for the sake of time, we're going to move on to the next slide here. But if you do have any questions at all at any point, again, don't feel like you can't raise your hands. You're more than welcome to interrupt. Um, and I really like that, Cecilia, being of service through creativity and storytelling. That phrase by itself, I think you could really use that as a mission statement. Um, it's very succinct, and it definitely tells me what, what your aim is. So a little bit more about getting to know your audience. You know, it's always useful to do research, right? Research is going to be a great way to inform pretty much every aspect of your business. When I was creating Distill Arts, I went through the whole process of developing a business plan with the support of the small business organ. Um, sorry, the small business uh, center uh, located in Koreatown somewhere. Um, I can't off the top of my head. I can't remember the name of the organization. Um, but I actually went to these classes where they taught us the the general structure of a business plan. 
and one of the things that obviously coming from the nonprofit world, I already knew how to do was doing a community needs assessment. You know, if you can better understand the needs of your community, the needs of your core demographic, the better you can actually uh, kind of craft your services around those needs. You know, it may not be that you necessarily have to recreate the wheel, but if you can do it in a way that serves a specific group that is missing access to that wheel, you know, then that's how you can approach the 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 like service that you're going to develop for for that community. And again, you know, not all market needs are equi equivalent to each other. You know, what the people of maybe San Pedro need is going to be different to what the people in Pacoima need. You know, it's going to be different to what is maybe missing in the West Side versus, you know, what is missing in the Antelope Valley. You know, these communities are very different. They're each distinct from one another. And it's really, really important to understand the needs of each individual market if you want to create a business that is established within a specific region. Um, if it's not going to be region specific, you can always do other, other things like, you know, surveys. Uh, you can leverage your social media to kind of help you, uh, I don't know, develop an artist project that might involve people who maybe don't always have a voice in a project. Um, you know, you can find out what it is that they might maybe want to learn as well as how they want to learn. You know, those could be really useful things that you can turn into a workshop proposal for distill arts, you know, or it could be something that you could turn around and request funding for from like, say, the city of LA uh, through their individual uh, artist grants, their, their individual artist fellowships. So understanding the needs of your community is going to be very important. Data, data, data. You know, the more data you have, the more informed you will be. Um, so those are, those are really important things to, to consider. And then, of course, feasibility, right? How capable are you at this moment of actually meeting the needs of your community? If that means investing in a new laptop, well, you know, you need to figure out how to get that new laptop first. You know, if your uh, project is going to require you to travel, you know, but you're on public transit, you know, you're going to need to figure out, okay, what can I realistically do given the current timetables for, for public transit? You know, what can I do? What can I accomplish within a week or within a month? And how can I turn that into a program or how can I turn that into a service that I'm, that I'm doing? So, you know, feasibility is going to be very important. You may need a gaming laptop for reasons. Exactly. Um, and don't don't actually you know like underestimate the power of a gaming laptop. It might be called a gaming laptop, but if you're doing things in like a 3D space, or if you're conducting artwork that is you know uh, VR related, like you need those graphics exactly. So you know those those are things that you need to be able to articulate um, within you know reason right? Within a community needs assessment, within your feasibility assessment, like those are things that you want to be able to say, I need X tool to conduct X craft or X service or whatever, right? Um, and that's where this kind of comes in, right? Who funds your work? You have to, again, be honest about the value of your work at all times. A gaming laptop or a gaming computer is much, much more expensive than you know an iPad Air, right? You might be able to do some of the work that you need to do on an iPad, but if you gotta gotta really get into some like you know hardcore 3D graphics, some vectoring, like you need to be able to bring in that money, and you need to be honest about why you have to charge what you charge. So again, going back to that first slide where we were talking about the mindset, you know, you want to be comfortable with saying these are my reasons for charging $100 an hour. And, you know, from there, it can only grow. So, you know, these are these are really good things for you to keep in mind as you're developing your services, your brand, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, what does the world need, right? 
Does the world need another nonprofit or does it need just you, the artist, the individual that is trying to create something that speaks to a community? If you were to articulate this, right, who would your ideal patron or your ideal customer or your ideal audience member be? If it helps, I want you to take a moment right now. I'm going to give you another like two minutes, just gut reaction. Tell me the age, the race, the ethnicity, the gender, and the general area where they live. Just begin with those things, and then everything else will start to kind of fall into place. So again, you can put this in the chat now, but think about your art, right? Think about your artist projects that you're trying to develop. What, what group of people or what type of person would be the most suited to really enjoy the experience of enjoying your art? Cool people. <laughs> All right. Tell me what those cool people look like. What do they wear? Where do they come from? And, you know, that that is a demographic, right? The uh, the Beverly Hills mom in her mid-40s with disposable income, that is a demographic, and that is a very, you know, sought-after demographic in certain fields. Um, who is most likely to have money? Yeah, I mean, people with disposable income are definitely people worth um, charging more than $100 worth uh, or more than $100 an hour for your services, you know? And, you know, it, again, if you are the kind of person that also wants to include other people, you know, you can offset some of those costs, you know, for the people that maybe can't afford you at $100 an hour, you know, you can offset that cost by charging other people a little bit more, you know? So that is a way to, to make it happen. Um, homeless college students pursuing their master's degrees. Yeah, Abraham? You're speaking of Communism, Luis? That's what you just said? I am speaking of, <laughs> you know, still getting paid, you know, but making sure that it's equitable for, you know, other people, if that is something you wish to pursue, right? Um, you know, Angie wrote, the homeless college student pursuing their master's degree. Like, that is a demographic that has a need and could probably benefit from some form of activity, whether it be, you know, a creative writing class or, or you know, maybe even a, a zine making workshop, right? And so the question is then going to be, if that is your ideal patron, your ideal customer, you know, what can you then do to fulfill their needs, right? Indigenous brown female women who are mothers and need a way to de-stress, express, and connect. Ages 35 to 50, living in the Linwood Compton area. Very good. So, Roots, you have a very clearly defined audience there. Um, you know, and those are, those are definitely, like, data points that you can use to help you understand, you know, a little bit more, at least, what it is that they might need, right? Um, and if that is the type of person that you want to serve, you can always reach out to people who fit within that kind of um, uh, sort of template that you've created. And you can start surveying them. You can ask them, well, you know, what is it that you would want to do in order to de-stress? How do you look for connection in your community, right? And then that's something that you then turn into a monetizable thing for you as a, as a service provider. They wear hiking boots to prom. Yeah. So, again, you know, what does the world need? And what better way to answer that question than to define what the world is for you? Now, business plans are important, you know, and if you begin crafting a business plan now, it's something that will help you adapt as you grow as a business owner. Um, you may not need it, not in a hundred percent, you know, typed out sort of way right now, but the more you write down now, the more it'll serve as a foundation. And the reason why you want to write some of these things down now is because you really, really do want to begin defining your services. In most cases, your services will fall under one of two categories, either an artist project 
or a contracted service. Now, the difference is going to be maybe more along the lines of one is for you. You know, it's more of a personal project, whereas the other one is more for the community, for the people who are willing to pay you for X service, right? But artist projects, basically you own the content, you know, you are the one that is crafting it from top to bottom and you would not owe any kind of royalties to anyone else, you know. It can be community-based and it can be community-led. You know, there's going to be maybe some sort of limitations to that if you are, say, trying to do like a workshop series, you know. Um, but again, you know, it's going to be something that is more focused on your personal sensibilities, your personal uh, just artistic idea ideas, right? Contracted services are exactly what it sounds like. It's something that you're contracted to do. It's something that you're commissioned to do. If it's a class, you know, you would be commissioned to develop the lesson and you would be commissioned to deliver the lesson, all of that, right? That is a contracted service. And it could mean that you're an employee working for someone, or it could mean that you're a contractor and that they pay you just the one time or maybe a couple of times over the course of your contracted term. But, you know, that is going to depend largely on, again, you know, how you structure your business. This could also be something that is kind of like a, a patron system. If, you, if you're if you familiar with, uh, like, Things like um, Patreon or uh, even GoFundMe, you know, where you have like rewards tiers. You could be doing, you know, artwork that is relevant to you, but then it's funded by patrons. And so your patrons would be uh, expecting to get something in return for providing either a monthly recurring donation or uh, just a straight payout, you know, where they buy something from you. So these could be also known as collectors or benefactors or subscribers. Um, those would be essentially paying customers that, that pick up your work on a agreed upon rate, right? There are other things that you can do also to help diversify your revenue. You know, fee for services, you know, this is similar to contracted services, but this might be something that is uh, maybe more like a one-time thing or maybe more of a uh, like a speaking engagement or a performance. You know, these these are typically classified as fees for service. There's, of course, the artist grants and fellowships that we mention all the time, um, plus merchandise. You know, everybody is, I think, much more easier nowadays uh, or much more able to access uh, like print on demand services. So you can create things like t-shirts and mugs and you know keychains and all sorts of really fun interesting little merchandise things that could feature either your writing or your artwork or your photography um you know that's always obviously another way to bring in money um in a slightly more uh we'll call it passive sort of way um <laughs> if you put your own face on a t-shirt uh, at some point, I'm sure you will find people that will want to buy your face on a t-shirt. Um, a couple of things about selling merchandise. Yeah, your mom will buy one, that's for sure. I'm pretty sure my mom would buy one. Uh, of me, anyway. <laughs> but if you are selling merchandise or selling anything, you know, really, there's a couple of different things to consider, uh, mostly related to distribution. So, Obviously, having a website with e-commerce capabilities is very, very important. Um, Distill Arts uses Square, uh, squareup.com, which is not to be confused with Squarespace. But Square is a fantastic tool that I'm very happy to have invested in early on for Distill Arts because not only am I able to take credit card payments online as well as offline, but it's also grown to where it is our payroll service. It's also our web host, um, and there's also marketing elements attached to it. So uh, Square is a definitely a tool that I stand by if that's something that you choose to use as well. Um, if you're going to do books, you know, since the majority of us here are authors or uh, artists who are interested in printing our work, 
You can always do print on demand. There's um, Blurb, which is the website that we use for a lot of our printing. Uh, you can print uh, books and chapbooks and zines and posters and art prints and photo books and all sorts of amazing things using blurb.com uh, at a relatively low cost. And they also do worldwide shipping. So um, on your behalf, too, you don't even have to pay for extra for that. Uh, so, you know, that's always a great way to um, to sort of diversify your merchandise. There's also things like Printful. Um, Printful.com is another website that is very similar, except they do printing on T-shirts and tote bags and mugs, phone cases, all sorts of other things. It's just a matter of you uploading a design, attaching it to a particular product, and there you go. Drop shipping is a little bit more complex in that, you know, it's you paying for a service where, you know, they basically are a warehouse and they hold your merchandise and then they take care of the shipping when you tell them to ship it. So drop shipping is an option. And then of course there's direct sales, right? Where you go and you actually sell in person, whether that be at events or on consignment. Um, consignment is when you work with another, like say bookstore, coffee shop, et cetera, and you basically come up with an agreement where they will sell the work for you on your behalf. They keep a commission and then you get the rest. It's usually most commonly like a 60, 40 split. So you keep 60%, they get a 40% cut from the retail price. Um, Always, always, always use a contract when you're doing consignment, just like with any other, you know, uh, like multi-party transactions, whether that be forming a co-op or doing consignment, always try to protect yourself with a contract. And yes, we are brought to you by Square. <laughs> so again, ask yourself this question, what are you good at? You know, what are the things that you could offer as a service? What are the things that you could do now that could start getting you paid? And with that, I want you to make a quick little list. It doesn't have to be more than like two or three things that at this moment you feel comfortable with saying, you know what, a person can pay me to do this. This can be the beginning of your service list for your business plan. And again, I'll give you like two minutes right now, just gut reaction. What are two services that you can offer? I see Richard's already selling his. Good. Editing and proofreading. Perfect. Those are always good and always necessary. Being workshops and keynotes, talks. Excellent. Yeah, for those who have already some experience teaching classes, if you are living within um, basically LA County, it doesn't have to be just the city, but the city's library system, the LA public library system, they have a performers and artists, uh, like list or pool, you submit an application and then you can go to the libraries and actually get paid to teach a class. Um, you know, it's going to depend on the individual library and what their friends of the library might be able to afford. But that is one potential way in which you could potentially start making money off of your teaching skills. As Nancy said already, the state of California through, I believe it's the state library system, um, they offer the California Poets in the Schools program. And that is also, as long as you pass their application requirements, uh, that is also a way in which you can potentially go into classrooms uh, at pretty much any grade level and get paid to teach a creative writing class. If you are, say, you know, open to doing editing and proofreading, you can determine now how many cents you want to charge per word. And, you know, it's not that uncommon to charge like 10 cents, 15 cents per word for editing and proofreading. And people will pay that because it is a valuable service. So as long as you know that that is a service that you are capable of providing, you can, you know, articulate that through your website, through your marketing, however you go about telling people that this is a service that you offer, that's a way for you to begin that, that next step, right, of 
offering a service at a rate that you feel comfortable giving. Uh, the LA Public Library was the first one, and then the California Poets in the Schools. Off the top of my head, I don't have the um, website where you can download the form for the LA Public Library, but I'll try to find it and then I'll share it in our Google Classroom. And then California Poets in the Schools, I believe is cpits.org, if I remember correctly. Oh, CaliforniaPoets.org. Thank you, Nancy. I just remember they go by CPITS. I want to share with all of you very briefly about, um, I think I want to say this was like maybe about 11, 12 years ago, a friend and I had developed an idea for creating our own artist co-op. And because I was already in the process of creating the, um, oh yeah, there's the LA County Library. So the LA County Library also has a, uh, an artist thing too, uh, which is different from the LA Public Library. So we do have two different uh, library systems in LA. Definitely take advantage of both. LA Public Library and LA County Library, and you know, get those those applications in so that you can be part of their artist pool. Um, but like I was saying, about twelve years ago or so, I had developed an idea for an artist co-op with a friend, and this was actually an activity that we did to help us begin brainstorming how we would uh, ultimately use this co-op. It ended up not happening because we just got busy with our lives, but um, this outline really, really did help, not only with me kind of determining what I wanted to do for Distill Arts, but also, you know, it helped us have a very open conversation about what we each wanted to do in terms of the artwork that we were creating at the time. So, you know, I'm not going to go into too much depth, but as you can see here, you know, when we talk about audience, you know, we want to be uh, both general and specific at the same time. You know, this is sort of where you want to think about the value of merchandise. If you're going to be creating merchandise as your way of earning a passive income through your, your work, um, you know, you can also kind of think about the ways in which people are uh, maybe attracted to certain styles or certain types of art, you know, uh, I think somebody was, was sort of making fun of the, the idea of them wearing, um, stretchy pants earlier, right? But if it's a person that you know probably listens to things like NPR and public radio, you know, and they support that, and they would support your work, well, why not say that? Why not be transparent about that? Um, so, this is a way in which you can approach answering some of those questions that we had talked about before. You know, who is your audience? What does the world need? What do you love? What is it that you hope to get out of this? It's also good to understand that you will have com competition, right? So be be out there and say, you know what? These are these are my competitors. Sorry, ah, this thing keeps on jumping. All right, so you know. It might be a little bit of a of a stretch to say that somebody like Shepard Ferry or Banksy is one of my um, one of my competitors, but it's not really, you know, because I also do you know graffiti based art, right? And who else does that in a space that is kind of social justicey? Well, Shepard Ferry and Banksy, right? Um, so you know, this is a way for you to uh, kind of get a sense of where. Some of this information came from, I hope, and also a way for you to potentially start thinking about your own business plan and how you can turn some of this brainstorming into a possible plan that you can then take to a bank um, or take to a lawyer and say, you know, this is generally speaking what I want to do. What is my next step? Can I get a line of credit? Can I, you know, actually go through the process of incorporating as a LLC? Or does it make more sense to be a sole proprietor? You know, these are ways in which you can begin to uh, really define your services and your brand. And of course, I created this for you. So this is attached as part of the, um, the handout that we've covered tonight. 
So you can download this again from our Google Classroom and you can begin answering these questions for yourself. And you can use this again to translate into an actual business plan. Um, I'm not gonna provide you all with a sample business plan because business plans can take like a whole other um, session to, to go over. But generally speaking, these are the different sections of any business plan that you might develop. So um, this handout, this worksheet is there for you to be able to, um, for homework, as you see, uh, start crafting your business plan. So complete the brainstorming, uh, the branding brainstorm worksheet that, that is provided. Uh, you can always bring that to one of our workshopping sessions if you want us to review it for you. Um, but generally, you know, this is this is a tool for you to kind of start putting yourself in that mind frame of a business owner. Because in the end, as creative entrepreneurs, you know, you've already made the first step in being a part of this program. You've clearly shown that you want this to become part of your career, um, that you want art to be a, an integral part to your life. So, you know, get this thing started. And remember, if you don't drive your business, you will be driven out of business. And as Van Gogh said, what is not started will never get finished. Don't let that, you know, blessing become a curse later on, as uh, Paulo Coelho said. So, ah, thank you, Evan, for sharing that uh, link for the performers for LAPL. So, all right, everyone. Do we have any questions? Does anyone have anything that they would like clarification on before we close out for tonight? As always, you can reach out to us directly. Um, for anybody watching on the live stream or you know afterwards on YouTube, you can learn more about our programs at distillarts.org. And of course, you can always follow us on social media with at DSTL Arts. And any questions? I just have to say, this is wonderful um, as an as a I mean, obviously I'm on the team, but this is my first time experiencing this actual, you know, presentation. And man, I wish I had gotten this presentation 10 years ago. Seriously, <laughs> could have saved me some heartache and trouble. <laughs> so, yeah, this is great. Why don't we, yeah, like give some love. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I recognize it is a lot to think about. It's a lot to absorb, as Jamie says in the chat. Um, but, you know, part of the reason why I started Distill Arts, uh, as I've mentioned before, you know, I, I was struggling as an artist myself, and I wanted to know how do I turn this into a career? I had to teach myself a lot of these things. So a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about comes from personal experience. Um, I've been practicing art since I was a kid. And I always knew I wanted to do this as a career. But it's not always something that's made clear to us, especially for us people of color, you know, in communities of of color and, and the the sons and daughters of immigrants, you know, we we don't always have this kind of support. So um, so that's where a lot of this is coming from. And I really hope that you, you know, feel like this answered some of the questions you might have. And if at any point you do have any questions that you weren't able to ask now or that come up later, um, you know, take advantage. Uh, we are here to to help you, to guide you. Um, Distill Arts is more than just, you know, this one single program. We're, we're an entire organization dedicated to teaching artists to, to turn this into a career. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're here for y'all. And I think with that said, I'm going to launch a quick little survey just because it helps me kind of better understand the, the work that we're doing and its impact. So uh, it's a quick seven little question survey uh, about, I think five of the questions or six of the questions are required, um, but it's very quick. It won't take you very long to do. I would appreciate it if you filled it out. Um, I'm going to leave that open for a few minutes and I'm going to go ahead and actually end our recording and end the live stream. And I just want to thank you all again for joining us tonight. And, you know, this, this is only the beginning. We're going to have more of these sessions over the next several months. 
uh, each one kind of touching on the previous ones, but we're going to try and teach you as much as we can about turning this into a career. So thanks again, everybody.